gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Marco Edinger, who's going to do a talk today on a tour through Swift attributes. Over to you, Mar Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great to be here. Um, yeah, the title of my presentation is a tour through Swift attributes, but there will be a highlight topic and this will be system programming interfaces, which is an experimental feature uh, represented by an experimental attribute. So a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I live in the Bay Area. I'm developing iOS apps and frameworks for over a decade now at my day job. And um, personally, in my spare time, I like to contribute to the iOS community with open source tools. Um, just I have mentioned here just two. Swift Plant UML is an Xcode extension and a command line tool which you can use to generate uh, UML diagrams from Swift code. The other example is XC Snippets app, which is a macOS application to aggregate and share with you all the Swift code snippets from the community, and then you can easily apply that to your Xcode installation. I love to write and share my programming knowledge on my blog, but I'm also super happy to be here. And you can find me on GitHub and Twitter under at Marco Eidinger. Attributes. Uh, what I will show you is a non-exclusive list of official attributes. And I think you have run in one or two or even more of these because there are quite a lot of attributes. Um, and we use Swift attributes uh, every time. Uh, one example is generated code when using the Xcode template for creating an iOS app with a Swift UI interface. So what you see here then is that the struct is annotated with an at main attribute. And this attribute um, can be applied to a structure, to a class or enumeration declaration to indicate that it contains the top level entry point for the program flow. And the type must provide a main type function that doesn't take any arguments and, return, and returns void. So, but you don't see here any implementation from our side as app developers. So if we look into Swift UI in and into the app type, then we see that the necessary implementation is provided by the Swift UI framework. Uh, it has this necessary main function, and you can even see that um, the the declaration of that function has also something which may look like an attribute, but it is not an attribute, but it is powered by an attribute. Uh, but I will talk about this in a moment more. So attributes are part of the Swift programming language. There's something which the Apple developers have foreseen for us. There is a way to uh, annotate our types and declarations to give the compiler more information of what to do. And uh, you can specify an attribute by writing the add symbol followed by the attribute's name and any arguments that the attribute accepts. Uh, some declaration attributes accept arguments uh, and that specify more information about just the attribute and how it applies to a particular declaration. Uh, these attribute arguments are then enclosed in parentheses and their format is defined by the attribute they belong to. There are um, two kinds of attributes uh, and that's mainly on where you can apply them to. There are declaration attributes and their um, type attributes. And I give here for each one an example. Uh, the add frozen attribute is something which you can um, apply to a declaration, like mainly to an enumeration, but technically you can apply to a struct as well. And it restricts the kinds of changes that you can make to the type. Um, this attribute is allowed only when compiling in library evolution mode. So for the 
app developer, this may not sound too interesting, but for SDK developers, it's definitely interesting because it defines uh, what kind of changes can be done in future versions of the library. Uh, because once you apply the add frozen attribute uh, to your declaration, you uh, cannot add, remove, or reorder the enumeration cases. Or in case of a structure, you can't change the stored instance properties. So um, for an enum, this has, um, for example, the advantage that uh, if you do a switch statement over a frozen enumeration, that doesn't require a default case. Here are two examples of a type declaration. Uh, we hear the auto closure and the escaping uh, attributes are used. Uh, and I assume maybe you probably know uh, more about these because they are like fairly common attributes. So I will just continue. Um, but I want to point out like two areas where attributes are really essential building blocks. One is in Swift UI. Um, in this case, where you want to change state within a view, uh, you have to annotate your variables with at state. And at state, even the type of how do you declare this looks like an attribute. It's a type itself. It's a struct which is powered by an attribute. Uh, it has the add property wrapper declaration to it. And in addition, the add frozen. So um, if you are familiar with SwiftUI and you know state, binding, environment, these are all property wrappers, which were built with the underlying property wrapper attribute. Another example is um, concurrency. Um, we will have the main actor, which is a global actor that um, uses the main queue for executing the work. So in practice, this means methods or types marked with the at main actor uh, can be safely be modified, uh, can safely modify the UI because they will always be running on the main queue. Um, again, at main actor is not an attribute in this case, but it's a type which uses uh, another attribute, the at global actor attribute, um, also conforms to global actor. And we can see then that in its implementation, if we look into the concurrency framework, we see that the implementation itself um, uses another important type attribute, the uh, at sendable. And I think this is something um, which we should keep in mind for the future because the Swift team already announced we want to make Swift more safer. And uh, if you want to pass around um, bits of code, blocks of code, which should be uh, executed in a concurrent context, then they have to be uh, sendable and you have to declare them as sendable. Uh, right now, this doesn't lead to an error, but maybe with Swift 6, this might be a breaking change. And uh, that's why they already advertised that. So um, yeah, that's another great example of how attributes are used by the Swift team to do amazing stuff. But there are also interesting um, use cases. Um, more, I just pick now uh, a couple of attributes. They, and those are extensively used in Swift UI, but they are not, they are, they are not, um, um, they're not limited to Swift UI. So one example is worn unqualified access. And I wish Apple would have used that even in Swift UI more, because you might have run into a situation where you try in Swift UI to call a few modifier and you forget the dot at the beginning, you may run into a crash. And if you are creating your own custom Swift UI few modifiers, then you can make those safer by annotating uh, them with the add one unqualified access attribute. 
So then X called as the IDE is then able to show um, compiler error to say, no, no, you try to access something unqualified and you need the dot. So uh, that's a good point if you are writing Swift UI if you modify it by yourself. Another example are result builders. And result builders have also a, a, a long history, um, um, which I will talk about a bit in a moment, but you can use result builders to create cool uh, DSLs. So there is a um, behind this link and I will share this presentation with you where you then have the links. Uh, so by the way, this first one goes to a blog post of mine and this one goes to a GitHub repository, which I believe is the name of awesome result builders and there are great examples of how you can use them so for example if you are if you want to work with uh, html then um, it would be good if your apis can resemble the work with html that you have like a top level node html then uh, like a nested um, attribute or function which then defines the, the 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 head and the body parts of an html document so this is how you can um you can use result builder property to build exactly these cases um, one prominent example in swift ui is um swift charts they're using this extensively under the hood but swift ui itself as well then there are property wrappers we had that already um and you can use property wrappers to create reusable property implementation patterns. So um, there's a great post by Paul Hudson on the swift.org blog, uh, which is called Property Wrappers in the Wild. And uh, he is sharing uh, various examples from the iOS and Swift community, how they're using property wrappers. Um, one case, for example, like of a property wrapper is that uh, whatever value you assign to an uppercase property wrapper, the implementation of the property wrapper then ensures that the value gets uppercased. So that's quite interesting. And as my last examples, uh, there is an at underscore always emit into client. Um, this already looks different um, from our normal notation of a Swift attribute. And Swift UI uses uh, this experimental attribute to backport new features. So if you ever wonder, uh, okay, how Swift UI may be able to, when a first API came out available in iOS 13 and then they introduce now uh, uh, something new to it, an, an initializer which can also target the same OS version, then that's the reason um, why. And there's a great uh, blog post, which I link to it. I don't want to, uh, where you can find all the information and details about that. Um, and because I showed you this underscore, so there's also like, two notions of attributes. One, there are stable official attributes, which you can find their documentations uh, on swift.org in the reference manual, basically when it describes the, the language itself, where what are declarations, what are types, you can find a section of attributes there as well. And these are official ones, they're stable ones. They went through um, the Swift evolution process. They are well-defined, but there are also um, other ones. But before I go into what are the other kinds of attributes, code is always better than documentation, I believe, uh, because they just can get out of sync. And I want to share with you where you can find where the attributes are actually defined. In um, Swift 5.7, you can find them in the Swift repository on GitHub. Um, and there is an uh, atra.dev file, which lists out the various type 
and declaration attributes. And in Swift 5.8, this is currently the main branch on this repository and beyond, the code ownership actually changes. So you now have to look into Apple's Swift-Syntax repository to find the latest um, types or uh, the latest attributes. So they're replacing the atra.dev file with a jib file that reads them from Swift syntax to automatically generate the necessary Swift code for that. So I also dropped here the link where you can find that. That's quite nice. And uh, if you have a look at then this file, you will see something like this where uh, you can uh, get a good idea already of maybe where you can apply the attribute uh, to and what's the impact. So in this case, we look at the one unqualified access attribute and we can see that it is a uh, that you can apply this to, to functions and to accessors. Um, and it is over time in contrast to, um, for example, the at frozen property, once you add this, it would be a breaking change for the API to, to remove this. So, um, and this file contains all the necessary uh, declaration attributes as well as the type attributes. But also you would, maybe get more information about the behavior. Maybe the documentation already describes this to a certain degree, but you want to have a more deeper understanding. Then I recommend that you look at the tests because they reveal the specification. So the tests itself, they still remain in the Swift repository of the Apple organization on GitHub. Um, I share here an example for the one unqualified access attribute, where we can see, for example, that it is an uh, here on 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 the top, uh, we can see that it's an expected error if you try to apply this attribute to a variable, uh, or the same thing, it it would be an error if um, you would apply it to a struct. Um, or even it is expected if you try that on a, on a, on a top level one. Uh, but there are then cases where it's okay. So I think it's always good to, to look into the, uh, the uh, tests if you are unsure how the behavior will be. And um, I think uh, they mostly organized uh, their folder structure so that each attribute has a dedicated test um, file but there might be more so you have to check that out um, like i said there are experimental attributes they are the ones with the underscore they are also getting uh, visualized differently they are not in, in, if you're working with xcode normally attributes they have this nice magenta uh, color and uh, if you're using at underscore they're just simply white or plain um, from a from a foreground color perspective. And um, the the Swift developers, they started to document this. And I think that's really, really good. Um, I love it. Um, it is also documented in the Swift repository uh, under Apple's organization on GitHub. Um, they have a folder called Docs reference guides, and they have currently one document there, which is the underscored attributes markdown document, which describes um, experimental features. Um, but warning, in this markdown file, it is clearly stated that Apple discourages using underscored attributes because those semantics are subject to change and most likely need to go through the Swift evolution process before being stabilized. So, yes, they are discouraged. And if you don't know what uh, what they do, if you don't have really the need to do uh, to use them, then don't. However, just because something is experimental, there will always be a group of people who may benefit from that work. 
And if we look back, a very good example uh, where early adoption paid off because there was a successful transition from an experimental status to the stable um, status so that it became a proper part of the, the language itself was uh, function builder. At underscore function builder was the experimental representation of what is now uh, known and used at the at result builder attribute. So at uh, underscore at underscore function builder was introduced in Swift 5.1. In Swift 5.4, this was stabilized. But even now, now today, you can still have code with at underscore function builder and it still works. Um, so yes, of course, it is good if you would rename that and this should be the only effort um, you have. But the Swift language has um, still implemented a fallback to ensure backwards compatibility. So even if your code um, uses uh, at underscore function builder, uh, it works. And I think this is like a, a very special case. I don't think that they are doing this for all the cases where experimental attributes were used. Sometimes they are really removing experimental attributes. Uh, they might change the semantics. So that's the risk you take. Uh, and this is really one successful case where um, it went in, uh, it went into the, the language itself as a stable attribute, but they uh, kept the experimental notation for backwards compatibility. And now that I have talked about what are attributes, the kind of attributes, declaration attributes, type attributes, their stable attributes and their experimental attributes, I would like to talk about uh, system programming interfaces. And the content I show you here, um, is also part of a blog post of mine. Um, and this is a feature. First of all, maybe I should define what an API is. Uh, that's uh, normally entities in a library uh, that a client may use. And in Swift, this is normally all declarations which are marked with the uh, public or with the open um, access level. So. Um, all then this uh, can be seen as the application programming interface because uh, people who import uh, the, the shopping module, they have then access to this shopping cart struct. They can initialize it um, and they have this function called uh, then pay cash. But system programming interfaces is a is actually a subset of the API of public interfaces, but they're only available to certain clients. So uh, you can see here that this um, shopping cart, it, that is shopping module and it's shopping cart struct. Uh, it has here now new public functions uh, like PayPal, uh, pay with PayPal, pay with Bitcoin, and those are annotated here, right? Uh, with underscore, with uh, uh, the, the at underscore SPI attribute. So as a library developer, you can ship experimental features to dedicated clients, for example, in-house teams while hiding those features to other clients and all within the same build artifact. I think that's really the, the key point here. And to further um, illustrate this, I have an example, um, but I want to say that SPI is something which sees um, some kind of evolution over time. Uh, so originally it was in Swift 5.3 that the first attribute was introduced. Uh, SPI. Then in Swift 5.7, we see uh, SPI available. And even now, if we look into the master slash main branch, which probably becomes Swift 5.8, we can see the SPI only attribute. So now we have already three attributes in the realm of system programming interfaces. And let's start with the first one, with the very basic one, which is already very powerful. 
And in this case, I share here a short video of, um, of Xcode. So I want to introduce a new function, but I don't want to make this function available for everyone, just for people who know the secret. And the secret is the name. <laughs> in this case. So if we try to um, access this function's PI access level protection, but if we are using the attribute to annotate the import statement of the module, import shopping module, and we add the add underscore SPI PayPal, then suddenly the compiler does not complain. It works fine. And this is done because uh, if you are familiar with, if you are building with a library evolution mode, you get a Swift interface for each module. So in this case, this is the default Swift interface, uh, though the one and only which we knew about. Uh, and it had only the uh, pay cash function. But once we at the at SPI attribute, uh, which is a declaration attribute uh, to our declaration of our new function pay with PayPal. And uh, then we get actually a second Swift interface file, um, .private um, um, Swift interfaces, which now suddenly contains the function pay with PayPal. So it's the same build artifact, but you have two Swift interfaces files. And before you share your then binary framework, you just remove the, the, the private Swift interfaces file to consumers, which should just use the regular versions. And for certain clients, you share the private Swift interfaces file with them, and they can then um, access the pay with PayPal function in this case, if they're annotating their import statement. Um, SPI available. Um, the idea here is like the at available attribute that the attribute indicates a declaration that is available only uh, as an SPI and um, that it's only available at a certain point of time. So in this um, case here in the public Swift um, in in the in, in the public Swift interfaces file, uh, it will this um, property items will be marked as unavailable on WatchOS, but with the um, but with the private Swift interfaces file, it will be available on WatchOS starting with WatchOS nine. Um, and then SPI only, uh, that is something a little bit uh, which is currently in development. And uh, it's not only that you currently have to um, do some code changes, but you also have to ensure that you are building with a with the front end flag um, called dash experimental SPI only imports. And you can once you have done this, if you ensure that you're building with this uh, front end flag, you can annotate an import statement of a requirement, like in this case here, import CryptoKit, it's a dependency. And you say, I, I only want to make this visible in my Swift interfaces files um, for certain clients. So the import statement will only be printed in the private Swift interface file and will be skipped in the public interface file. So we can see here that's the, the public uh, Swift interface file. We don't see here the, the import statement for CryptoKit, but uh, with that feature in the private interfaces file, we would see then the, um, uh, the, the import statement CryptoKit. And I think that goes if you're curious about kind of like these kind of things, uh, for example, like if you use like testable, uh, there are quite some other experimental attributes with access level. There's uh, add underscore private so that 
uh, if you use that, you may allow access to private functions or properties um, of your module. Uh, and there are like um, like something which which represents like a like a private um, import as well. And uh, you can also define how the rule is how to export um, others. So, so there are quite some experimental attributes you want to check out if you are um, interested in that area. And I believe um, that's it for my presentation. Um, thank you for, for, for uh, listening to me, for having me here. And I'm more than happy to answer questions or maybe go into Exco to, to make things more clearer if that helps. Great, thank you, Marco. Let's see um, if anyone's got any questions on uh, Twitch. Uh, as there's a delay, let's just give a few minutes. I've got someone called Sonia who said thanks. Looks like there's no questions yet. Um, okay. So, uh, out, 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 out of interest, uh, do, do, do you focus a lot on? Uh, do, you, do you focus mostly on the, the app development, or uh, do you do much server side development? Uh, I Swift? don't. I don't do server side development with Swift, but I'm in a team where I'm the lead architect uh, for teams who are developing SDKs. So frameworks, reusable frameworks. So that's why one topic SPI is pretty interesting for us because it uh, would give us the ability to share features early on with a small set of customers. Um, and um, yeah, that's why I I found this topic and others very interesting. Um, some of the examples of the attributes are definitely of interest for app developers as well. Um, it, even if you're just like not modularizing your Swift UI app, yeah. for example, the use of the worn access attribute is beneficial for you and your colleagues. But for other attributes like add frozen and uh, SPI and others, they're more relevant if you are in a team or in the situation where you're developing um, SDKs, uh, frameworks, which can be um, reused. And sometimes even if there are binary frameworks, right? If you kind of like give them the source code anyway, then that's maybe kind of like um, questionable. But I even saw that like Swift Syntax, which is open source, they are using SPI already to differentiate between like raw data and I, I, get, get, I, I believe it's then like, prepared data that they can parse. So that's quite interesting that they also are using SPI themselves. Great, great. We, we don't have any more questions, but the, the, Eric again on Twitch did uh, say he would be interested in seeing some Xcode examples, if you wanted to do that or not. Up to you. Did I lose you, Marco? Are you there? Sorry, what was that like? I think my internet connection is not the best. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm yeah, back. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. I can now. You're great, great. I was just saying that um, uh, uh, Eric again on the Twitch chat is asking if you do have time to show some Xcode examples. Um, but it's but it's up to you if you have something ready or not. If you sure, yeah, okay. sure, no, no problems. I try to get some Xcode open. Um, I'm trying to see if I can. The real big kicker is that for some reason I'm not, cannot even share my whole screen because I would love to switch between like the finder and stuff like this. Yeah. Um, it's this unusual is, because I've set up as co-host as well, which means that you should be allowed to do yeah. everything from a yeah. permission wise. So I don't think it's a permission yeah. issue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me share first Xcode kind of yeah. like where you can Wait. see it uh, uh, more clearly. And I think I have also open source this uh, little project of mine here where I have a Swift package 
which explicitly demos the part of that uh, where I have here um, one library which has the uh, shopping module in it. And I am using here the Swift settings unsafe flex to say I build with library evolution. And then in this case, I, my shopping module has um, just one file, which mainly contains the um, this, this, this struct shopping card. And here you can see uh, that I have annotated this. So by the way, you can also, uh, you won't find this uh, with the auto completion. So if you are looking, um, uh, so you can find other attributes, for example, like available. And by the way, you can see this here by this uh, rectangle and the dot in the middle. That's uh, the indicator for it, that this is an attribute. And it describes what kind of attribute this is. Actually, it's a declaration attribute. I don't know why they're writing this here as a function attribute. Um, but you can also, for example, find this in here. So this is uh, the auto completion is context aware of, of what you're currently writing. So now it says it's a declaration attribute, but you won't find this uh, uh, with auto completion. So if I try to write SPI, there's no there's no auto completion by Xcode because uh, the reason for that is uh, if you look into uh, Swift syntax in the repository, which I shared, where there's this one file with all the definitions, there is an uh, there there is an option that they said um, I think it's called user inaccessible, and this does not necessarily mean you shouldn't you can't use it. It just means that the auto completion will not show it to you because they, they want to hide it a little bit. They want to make it a little bit more difficult to use it and that you will only use it uh, if you have to. So in this case, I can still write the necessary annotation for that. And in this case, um, again, I make here the case where I try to import that statement uh, without the attributes. So in this case, PayPal is inaccessible to the SPI protection level. But once I'm setting this here, and then you can see that the compilation works. And if we look into now to prove this also, why this is working, let me bring up my finder. And um, maybe I try to... Uh, now I switch my sharing again because it because it would not work otherwise. So I have also built the Swift package from the command line tool with Swift build. So that's why I don't have to look into the derived of um, data folder, but I can look into this um, dot build folder, which is normally hidden. And if I look at our uh, at our debug folder here, then why oh, is this the right one? Oh, do I have to build this one again? Oh, I might be in the wrong folder here. Let me just check this. Show finder and... Um, Swift, oh, okay, sorry. I have to go, I think here in the, in this folder here. No, it's still the one. Okay, I have to share my... I'm, I'm in the wrong folder. I've named that wrong. So I will share this finder here. So what you can see here is that I have these two two files, right? Uh, I have, I, I make this a little bit bigger here. Uh, I have this um, shopping private Swift interface file and the shopping Swift interface file. So normally without SPI, if you're building, if, uh, if you're building with library evolution, you only get this one target specific Swift interface file, which is a textual representation of your public APIs. And, but if you are using SPI somewhere in your target, it will create this uh, private uh, Swift interface file, which you should hold back for your regular clients. And you should only give that to the ones you want to share 
uh, these new APIs with that. And then you can uh, see that in this declaration um, that this now contains the, uh, the, the public function. By the way, because SPI only cares about API, meaning public and open uh, declarations, uh, you can't use this experimental attribute on internal or on private uh, functions, types, uh, or structs, or whatever, uh, because uh, you can only apply it to, um, um, yeah, to, to to public or to open uh, declarations. Um, yeah, I think maybe that helped a little bit to kind of like um, look around. I'm really sorry. I don't know why I cannot share my whole desktop because then it would be much more easier to to jump also to blog posts and to to GitHub to show you the declarations. Um, but I will share the the the, the presentation or the links uh, within the presentation. So that's probably really helpful if you want to dig deeper into the topic by yourself. Um, you certainly can do. And one thing maybe I share as the last part of it is. Um, when I can share my my Safari browser here, which is I have to make it smaller first, and now I can share Safari. So, but by the way, so this is the um, that's what I refer to the documentation of attributes. These are the stable ones, the official ones, under Swift.org. Uh, the, prog the Swift programming language guide, you have a whole section about attributes, but they don't list every attribute. Um, so that's why I'm saying you should rather look into the code or at least for the test cases. So for github.com, Apple, um, and then Swift, you, not Swift package manager, this was auto completion. No. And you have here tests, you have here the RTTR folder for attributes, and you can, fi uh, can find here various test cases for all the official and, un and experimental attributes. If we look for SPI, we can find here like a test file for SPI available. Uh, we and uh, let's have a look. So this one was like the other property, which was introduced in uh, Swift 5.7. And we can see, for example, that um, symbols that are SPI available on all platforms should use uh, the SPI instead. So a, dec so a definition with deprecated and renamed does not work. Um, and also like um, there are, here, if you're doing kind of like a typo, there are still tests by the Swift compiler group that they catch all these things. Um, so uh, that's a part where I would look into if you want to learn more about uh, about attributes, how they are behaving. Um, I mentioned, for example, like private import. So this is like an example where you can give um, where you can give access to private uh, functions and attributes of a file by using this experimental attribute. So there are quite some interesting cases, but I think this is something which normally an app developer is, does not really care about, but really SDK developers, um, or for example, if you don't want to use a testable, that this might be another workaround for you. So yeah, I hope that was a little bit more helpful. Yeah, great. Uh, Kicking Vegas has put uh, on the chat uh, with attributes. It seems that you are given a lot of flexibility to do arguably bad things. Are there general conventions, guidance, best practices on using them, or are such things left to the developer? And and then his comment that related to that maybe apply that more to SPI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Um... I think that's also like one of the reasons why it's still experimental, right? Uh, because you could do some shenanigans which maybe are not intended towards. But I think there is definitely a need to say, okay, you want to 
uh, you, you, you want to um, share some progress early on uh, and uh, maybe get some feedback from customers about APIs and even kind of like agree with them that this might break, like depending on how you try it out, how you, what you give us feedback, we might make this uh, uh, APIs available in a different uh, form in the future. So yeah, I think that's the, the general um, thing of being really cautious. Like I do not blankly advise to use SPI or to use experimental attributes because Apple really um, officially discouraged you from using them unless you really have to, if there's a use case and you know what you're doing. So uh, I don't know any other really um, best practices around this. Uh, like I said, there's this one um, document, I think reference, reference guides. There's this folder here where you have the underscored attribute definition where you can see it's prim pri primarily for compiler and standard library developers. And I would extend this maybe with end SDK developers. Um, or for example, like function builders was a use case where SwiftUI itself used quite some their own experimental attributes. And they also like app developers said, we want to have the same thing. And then they moved this to the uh, stable version for that. So that's why uh, please use it really with caution. That's my advice. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any other uh, really good recommendations about this. My team is still thinking, experimenting with SPI. We haven't shipped uh, SDKs uh, with that uh, feature in. So this was um, a research topic of mine and we are still thinking about how we are using this uh, in the company I'm working for. So, uh, yeah, but in, in general, if you, um, I, I, I think there are some really good markdown documents in the Swift uh, repository itself uh, for certain topics, but yeah, they're, they're sometimes they're, they're experts, right? They know the Swift language and they have a certain focus on it and it's maybe not as uh, easy grasp uh, too easy to grasp for some outsider, for some app developer. Um, but if you have questions to specific attributes, I would also recommend that you may ask a question in the Swift forums. Like I personally, I got some really great feedback about this. Uh, they, it's most likely that your questions will be seen by these compiler developers, by the Swift programming language developers who can answer uh, very specific questions but I don't think that they will give like a broad guideline to that. Sorry. I saw a tweet on uh, Twitter the other day that uh, engineers at Stripe have coined the term foot gun for tools that give you the power to shoot yourself in the leg. So, so, so the, 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 the best practice around this, could, the, I, I guess, could, you, I guess that, that could fall under that category too, in a way. <laughs> yeah, I think everything what is experimental, you, you have to be careful, um, but you can definitely see on the other hand side, um, Swift really tries to make things um, easier. The whole evolution of the Swift languages is with the one aim to make things safer. Like people who are familiar with like Objective C and at the beginning of Swift, like you had uh, uh, you, you had to uh, do the retain and release cycle management yourself, then automatic. Uh, uh, then automatic retain counting came into place. And uh, nowadays. If you're using structs, which are getting advertised for, you don't even have to worry about this. Concurrency also make things much more safer. Um, and um, it, it, they advertise that you annotate your code so that the compiler can know that it's safe. Otherwise, it may raise an error or warning in certain situations. So um, definitely Swift is a safe language. But yeah, experimental is experimental and gives you some tools which um, may be dangerous in the wrong hands or how you're using it. So um, it's great. It, it's a great question and we should be aware of that. Kicking Vegas, who asked the question, says, thanks thanks for the response and presentation, Marco. And Eric Kicking has said amazing. Uh, that's a comment on Twitch as well. 
Okay. Right. Thank you. Right. Any more questions, everyone? Let's see if the, um, because of the delay, I guess we'll like wait one minute. Jeez. Yeah. Like I said, uh, I think the, uh, the 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 key aspects are also in my article here explained, um, uh, which also I think contains the link to this uh, to this project here. And uh, yeah, like if you are downloading the Swift Tools version, uh, the snapshot of um, from the main branch of the Swift language, the Tools version. Swift uh, uh, Swift 5.8, and then you are also able to try out the SPI only attribute. But uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it it's quite interesting, and um, yeah, it, it was a pleasure to be here. Uh, that was my first appearance here, and uh, hopefully not my last. And uh, uh, yeah, wish everyone a happy happy Saturday. Thank you so much, Marco, for this presentation. It was awesome having you here at this meetup. Please do come back. If there's anything you ever want to talk about more, just ping me and do come back. And hopefully we can coordinate something in person in 2023 when the world is a little bit more open and safer. <laughs> yeah, but, but other than that, but, but other than that, yeah, no, thank you so much for the, for the for, for coming and doing the presentation. I know it's a lot of hard work preparing a presentation, so uh, I can't thank you enough. And thank you, everyone, who attended. And, um, yeah, have a great Saturday, everyone. Uh, have a great Saturday, and uh, keep in touch. Keep in touch. Look out for uh, the Twitter our Twitter account. I'll announce the video, the recording of this being published on YouTube and PeerTube as soon as uh, as soon as I get around to editing it, uh, I'll make it available and I'll announce it on the Twitter account and I'll let Marco I'll, I'll let you, I'll ping you and let you know as well so we can all uh, take another look. Great, thank you all, thank you Marco. Have a great Saturday. Take care. Thank you. Bye you too. Now. Bye everyone. Bye.